Captain. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'd um, like to say that this is probably my last opportunity to speak to C45, and so I want to make sure that I give it uh, full coverage. Now, the government says that the reason they're bringing this legislation is that because what's in place now is not working. Um, well, Madam Speaker, what's proposed under C45 is not going to work either, even with the many amendments that are, have been brought. So what was this bill supposed to do in the first place? If we refer to the purposes in the bill, it was supposed to protect the health of young people by restricting their access to cannabis. Well, we can see clearly a couple of things in the bill right away that are going to put cannabis into the hands of young children. The first of all is the clause in, in Clause 8 where it allows a young people ages 12 to 17 to have up to 5 grams of cannabis. That is just the wrong message in any universe. We've talked about home grow and how when you have in excess of 600 grams of cannabis growing in your house, your young people are likely to get a hold of it in the same way they get a hold of liquor from the liquor cabinet. And so this is certainly not going to keep cannabis out of the hands of young children. Furthermore, I would say if the government has a belief that the systems that are being put in place in some provinces are going to help out, let me assure you, uh, Kathleen Wynne put in a, a process in Ontario of LCBO type stores and delivery. And for people in Sarnia Lambton, the closest store is London. And if they call their drug dealer today, in about 30 minutes, they can have whatever quantity they want delivered to their house for about $7 a gram. Uh, the government's proposed a price of $10 a gram with a dollar tax on top of that. If they think that's going to work to displace the organized crime that is in place, we're sadly, sadly mistaken. The other item I want to talk about with respect to the youth is the public education that was supposed to happen. The Canadian Medical Association has been clear that young people who use cannabis under the age of 25, 30% of them will have severe mental illness issues, psychotic disorders, bipolar, anxiety, depression, 10% will become addicted. Where is the public education on that? Where is the message to tell young people today that this is harmful? That message is not out there. Young people are saying it's no more harmful than alcohol. They're not getting the message. The only public campaign that has been done was done by the Minister of Public Safety who did a brief TV commercial to let kids know that they shouldn't drive while they're drug impaired, which while true is totally inadequate in order to get the kind of public education that was recommended by Colorado and Washington State. Colorado did $10 million worth of public education for a population that's a lot less than what Canada has. Washington State did the same. So that we're certainly not going to achieve the first objective of keeping it out of the hands of children. Well, what about some of the others? Um, will we provide for the, illicit, for the only legal production of cannabis to reduce illicit activities in relation to cannabis? Well, if we look at all the people that have um, legalized marijuana, we see that in Colorado, where they allowed home grow, they still have significant issues with organized crime. The police have a lot of nuisance complaints, and there's entire residential neighborhoods that smell. Lots of problems there. We look at Washington State, who decided they would not allow home grow except in the case of medicinal marijuana. And they were able in three years to reduce organized crime down to less than 20%. And because they set the age at 21, they were able to um, make it difficult for young people to actually get a hold of marijuana. And it's unlikely that 21-year-olds would be sharing with 17-year-olds, unlike the legislation that we have before us. Now, another problem that uh, has not been addressed by this government with respect to the home grow is about property owner rights. In Ontario and in Quebec, um, if you're a property owner, you actually um, are unable to prevent somebody, on, once this legislation is passed, from growing marijuana in your house. And for those who maybe are less experienced growing marijuana, there can be often a mold problem in the house. And I've been approached by the Real Estate Association who have asked the question, currently when there's a, a home grow in a house and we sell the house, we have to do a total remedi a remediation of the mold and a recertification of the house. Are we going to have to do that on all of the home grows? That question has not been answered by the government. The other question that hasn't been answered by the government has to do with impacts at the border. You know, I live in a border community. Conversations have been had with Homeland Security and with the border officials. They have said 
since Canada is changing their law, we are not changing our law federally. It still is illegal federally, and we are not adding resources because of Canada's law. Dogs will sniff. If people have secondhand smoke residue on their clothes, if your kid borrowed the car and happened to be out with other kids that were smoking marijuana, you know, if you are a smoker yourself, don't happen to have any with you, but you'll have the residue, the dogs will sniff it out. Then people will be pulled over into secondary, and they will go through the standard procedure there. The problem is there's not enough secondary for the number of people that will be pulled over. And when asked what they will do then, they have said, well, we will put a cone in the lane of the inspection that the person is, uh, is in, and we will perform the secondary inspection there, which will back everything up. They have informed us to expect up to a 300% increase in wait times at the border. The government has known about this for, for two and a half years. They have done nothing to establish any kind of agreement with the, the government of the U.S., other than to say, make sure you tell the truth which of course is great advice, but will not prevent the wait times and the problems that are going to be seen at the border. Furthermore, they have not educated young people to understand that if you're caught with marijuana in the U.S., it's a lifetime ban from that country. And the U.S. is not the only country that will ban you if you've had marijuana possession. There are a lot of countries in the world. And so for young people that intend to have a global career, they are not informed about this, and there could be very, very adverse con um, consequences from the public education that has not happened. Now, this bill was also supposed to reduce the burden on the criminal justice system. And so, unfortunately, we know that the Justice Minister is behind the eight ball in terms of putting um, judges in place. She's about 60 short. And because of that, we see murderers and rapists going free due to Jordan's principle. Now, if there was an intent on the part of the government to try to clear the backlog and make sure that those that have committed more serious crimes receive the punishment, one of the things they could have done, and it was suggested many times even since last September, was that they should let those who have marijuana charges drop off the list and get out of the queue so that the more serious offences can be prosecuted. But of course, the government has done nothing with respect to that, and so then again, they are not going to actually offload the system. In fact, there are more criminal charges under this legislation than previously existed. Because now, if you have five plants instead of four, that's an offense. Now, if you have 31 grams instead of 30, that's an offense. Now, there are offenses for transferring it to younger people. There are a lot of offenses that didn't exist previously. So definitely, we will not achieve that goal. And then there was a goal to provide access to a quality controlled supply of cannabis. Well, now that you've allowed home grow and everybody's going to be doing their own thing, there's actually no management of the quality control um, from this product. And so that is also not acceptable. Some of the other unanswered questions that we see have to do with workplace safety. This was raised when uh, the marijuana issue was studied by the original council. There was testimony brought to committee. There have been questions raised all over the place. How are we going to protect the employers who have the liability and the other employees who are worried? <coughs> Excuse me. They're worried, Madam Speaker, about people that may come to work drug impaired. We don't want to be flying Air Canada and have the pilots uh, impaired. We don't want to have people operating nuclear plants that may be drug impaired. And so now that Bill C-46, which was supposed to be the companion legislation to C-45, C-46 was going to allow mandatory and random testing on the roadside because people know it's dangerous to smoke drugs and then drive a car. So that was going to open the door then for people to say, well, if it's dangerous to smoke drugs and drive a car, perhaps it's also dangerous to then drive a plane or drive a train or operate a nuclear plant or any of these other things. But the question of workplace safety and how we're going to protect and what legislation is going to into place is a total blank space. We have not looked to our neighbours to the south who have legalized, who actually have both mandatory and random testing in place. I worked on many projects, and I actually had an office in the States at some point in time. And so I know they are able to medically screen people before they hire them, they are able to mandatory test them, and they are able to random test them. And this government has totally lacked leadership in addressing the issue of workplace safety, etc. Now with respect to the actual amendments that have come, some of the amendments were good and some of them were not good. 
Um, I really think that the one amendment that was brought that would allow 18-year-olds um, to share their marijuana or parents in a home to share their marijuana, uh, I'm glad the government decided not to accept that one. Obviously, I'm still concerned about the fact that there's even marijuana in the house, but if that would have been accepted, that would have definitely not been keeping marijuana out of the hands of young children. Now, one of the, the amendments that they did not accept had to do with the banning of um, promotional things like T-shirts, caps, flags that would have a cannabis symbol on them. And the government did not accept this um, amendment from the Senate. I'm very concerned about that. There's a lot of Canadians out there that are worried that when marijuana is legalized in Canada, that they're going to use Canada Day to come with flags that have cannabis on them. Everybody will have a t-shirt with cannabis on it, and it will be disgusting. It will absolutely denigrate our country and the people that have served our country and made Canada a proud country. It will deface that. And the government has allowed those people to continue to have that kind of paraphernalia by refusing the language here. Now, it's total hypocrisy because under S228, which talks about you know, prohibiting unhealthy advertising to children, God, we wouldn't want to see pop or something like that on a t-shirt or a flag. But hey, cannabis, that's okay. So I'm totally opposed to that. Another thing that the government should have taken into account was the amendment that was brought on capping the potency of THC. We've heard reports from all over Canada as people are increasingly um, trying marijuana for the first time or experiencing BC bud, which purportedly has one of the highest THC contents and there's a lot of potency. People are presenting at the emergency ward uh, with, with uncontrollable vomiting due to THC poisoning. And so knowing that and knowing that part of the intent of this bill is to protect the health of, of uh, Canadians and of the youth, uh, I can't understand why the government would not recognize that there needs to be some control on the potency of things that are, that are out in the marketplace. Some of the amendments that were compassionate uh, talked about giving people uh, more time to pay their fines. I thought that was good that the government accepted those. I thought it was good that they would consider um, uh, for young people uh, ages 12 to 17 that uh, were uh, experiencing an offense, that they were going to look at ticketed offenses, which is something that, that we would have supported, and restorative justice options. If we look to countries that um, are um, doing the best job of intervening and helping people to get off drugs, uh, look at Portugal. Uh, if anyone has found possession of drugs there, they're given an intervention with a medical person, um, a psychiatrist, and a legal person who can then try to figure out, you know, what is the root cause of why these people are self-medicating or why they are, are um, uh, becoming addicted and what can be done to help get them off of it in terms of mental health therapies or uh, drug addiction therapies, etc. So, you know, we, we need to look at this whole thing. Um, the other part that I, I think is unfortunate is that the Indigenous people have not been adequately consulted with. I was very disappointed um, to find that from September of last year, when we first heard uh, at committee from Chief Day and from the Métis Nation, they said they had not been adequately consulted. It's disheartening to hear that again, when this went before the Senate, the same message came out that they had not been adequately consulted with, that they wanted to have the ability within their own communities to define whether or not uh, cannabis would be allowed, and apparently under federal law, it was clarified to them that if it's a federal right of Canadians to possess cannabis, then it's not something that they would be able to come against. And there was some uh, resistance about that based on the sovereignty of the Indigenous people. So I think that was not resolved to their satisfaction. And it's worrisome that the government continues to rush ahead when they say this is the most important relationship, the nation-to-nation -nation relationship they want to have and they're willing to go and, and uh, throw uh, gasoline on a fire in terms of, of moving ahead when they've been asked not to do so. So, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, some of the other questions that, that arose at committee that really haven't been adequately answered um, have to do with a lot of the detailed specifics about who's going to pay. Um, municipalities are saying there will be a cost to them to implement, but they've not been included in the cost 
breakdown or, or the agreements that have happened. And, and so that is uh, of concern. There have also been concerns raised by people who currently are consuming medical marijuana and their understanding that there's, they're going to be paying tax on that. And typically in Canada, prescription medicines are not taxed. And so as long as they have a prescription from a doctor for their medicinal marijuana, um, my expectation would be that they wouldn't be taxed. But that's not what this government is saying. There is language in the, in the budget bill also that's a little bit suspicious that says they would exempt people from paying tax on medicinal marijuana that has a drug identification number. But the problem with that is that there are no medications that have a drug identification number because there are so many different components in marijuana that um, the companies have not been able to spend the research dollars required to characterize or to effectively quality control them to be able to meet um, a number like that. So that is a, a meaningless pro promise for sure. Now, uh, there were some amendments that were brought to bring this legislation in line with the tobacco legislation, and I'm in favor of having um, those uh, things aligned, but it seems unusual that the government would be spending $80 million to get people to stop smoking, but they'd be spending $800 million to get people to start smoking marijuana, especially when the Minister of Health has just stood up and talked about how they know there's harmful effects. Now, one of the things I find very, very um, interesting from a timing point of view is that today, Health Canada took off their web page the harmful impacts of cannabis. This is something that has been on the web page. I had a, uh, somebody bring it to my notice and to send me a screenshot of what used to be there and what is not there now. So it's very interesting that on the day that they want to see this legislation pass into law, suddenly they would take off the information that shows that there is harmful effects from cannabis, not just to young people, uh, but to others. And so I would request that the government not hide things, but that they try to be open and transparent, as they said that they are always trying to be, and that they would put that information back on the website, because every um, place that had legalized marijuana had said one of the most important things to do was to invest in public education. They wanted to target that education, not just at young people to understand the harmful effects that this would have on their brain, but also on adults, parents that can influence young people, and the general public, so that they could understand as well. I'm very concerned about some of the unintended consequences that will happen as a result of this legislation. I know that there are people already smoking marijuana today in Canada. But when it becomes legal, there are many more that will decide to try it. And they may not be informed about what the impact will be when they cross the border, about what the impact might be on their mental health or on the mental health of their children. They may not understand what the health impacts will be for they themselves. And they may not understand the ramifications in their place of work, how they're going to impact both their employer and those that work around them. So that said, Madam Speaker, um, I am very uh, opposed to the legalization of marijuana, which I've said on many occasions, not just because it's bad for you, but because this bill has so many holes in it and so many unanswered questions, and there are going to be so many bad unintended consequences for Canadians that it will be left to the Conservative Party when we come to victory in 2019 to clean up the mess that will be made by this government moving forward in this rushed and irresponsible fashion to implement this bill. Absolutely, this bill will not keep marijuana out of the hands of young children. It will not get organized crime out of this business. And it will not unload our criminal justice system and it certainly will not provide access to quality controlled supply. What we can expect is that Canada Day you can expect there'll be lots of people out with their t-shirts just totally insulting the, those Canadians that are proud of our country that are not in agreement and there are a lot of Canadians that are not in agreement with this legislation. And so with that, thank you very much, Mrs. Speaker. Well Questions and comments? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I want to begin by thanking uh, the member opposite for her remarks and her hard work on the, on the Health Committee. Um, her, her opinion is always valued. Um, uh, Madam Speaker, one of the things that I think is clear and what I've found is an overwhelming consensus right across the country is that the current system of criminal prohibition is failing our communities and our kids terribly. We have the highest rates of cannabis use among, 
of the children in the world. The entire production and distribution system of cannabis today in Canada is controlled by criminals. The, the product that our kids are exposed to is untested, unregulated, unsafe. And, and, and prohibition, I think there's, a, there's a generally an acknowledgement, it simply doesn't work. And it's only by lifting that prohibition and replacing it with a comprehensive system of regulation for its production, distribution, and consumption that we have any opportunity to, to, to bring some control to a situation clearly out of control, which is damaging our communities and enriching criminals. So I ask the member opposite, through you, Madam Speaker, would it be the int her intention that after the next time that, that her party may come into government, would you recriminalize this and reinstitute the prohibition after we've lifted it? Uh, I just want to remind the uh, Parliamentary Secretary to address the questions to the Chair. <laughs> uh, the Honourable uh, Member for Sarnia Lambton. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. And uh, he's absolutely right that when it comes to the, the situation that exists today, it's not a good situation. But if they were doing what was prudent, they would have put in place a system like Washington State's that actually reduced organized crime's involvement, that actually raised the age to 21 and made it more difficult for people to get a hold of uh, marijuana. Now, in terms of what will happen in the future, I look forward to the day that. Uh, we are victorious in 2019 in returning to government. At that time, it's like the toothpaste is out of the toothpaste tube. There will be a big mess to clean up. There will be a doubling of traffic deaths, which has been seen in every other jurisdiction. The public education that has not been done by this government, that was warned by every jurisdiction that put mar marijuana legalization in place, that is something that's going to have to happen for people to understand the harms. But by that time, there will be young people that have mental health issues and all of the traffic deaths and all of the unintended consequences to property owners. Thank you, Madam. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Vancouver, Kingsway. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, first, I want to express uh, uh, what a pleasure it is to work with my honourable colleague on the Health Committee. Um, I have to say that, you know, she, uh, she almost puts a reasonable uh, a gloss on the Conservative position on cannabis, and, and for that I congratulate her. But really, the position of the Conservative Party on cannabis has been extremely perplexing to me. We had the comments from the Honourable Member from Thornhill who compared uh, uh, a homegrown cannabis plant to the equivalent of it leaving opioids out for children. Um, and uh, of course, right now in Canada, the reality is with uh, extreme criminalization, in fact, a potential life sentence for trafficking, we have the second highest rate of cannabis use among young people in the world. But my question to her is this, is given that reality and given that millions of Canadians have used and currently use cannabis, don't feel that it's a criminal act, and given that uh, um, uh, her party's uh, position is opposed to legalization, uh, my question to her is this, it's on uh, the edibles and con concentrates provision. This bill continues to make edibles and concentrates illegal in Canada. And given that it's one, one of the purposes of the bill is to get rid of the black market, uh, I wonder what her position is, her party's position is, on the legalization of edibles and concentrates, or is she content to leave those products in the hands of organized crime? Who are selling those products in some cases without any of the regulations that I think Canadians want to see with those products? I remember for Sonia Lambton. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from the NDP because it's a pleasure to work with him as well on the, on the Health Committee, and he brings forward many good points. Some of the facts that, that come to bear on this question, 30% of the market today is edibles, and we did receive testimony from multiple jurisdictions that had legalized edibles, and they talked about some of the problems that they encountered originally with overdoses in children, especially with you know, gummy bear flavored and candy flavored um, items. And so um, having a very strict control and learning the lessons from those people will be important. But once again, the government decided not to accept to have parliamentary oversight when those regulations are developed. The bureaucrats will be able to put in place whatever they want, perhaps not listening to the learnings from other jurisdictions, and I'm against that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Saskatoon, Grassley. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. A couple of items. I want to thank the member from Sarnia Lambton talking about the education system. We've seen a few ads by this government on television, but not enough. They were prepared to spend three, four, five hundred thousand uh, dollars for an ad campaign. We haven't seen that, even though we could be months away from this bill becoming law, or even weeks ahead. Anyways, one of the things that I did in January was go to Nunavut. 
They have no addiction centers at all up north. They are concerned there isn't one addiction center in Nunavut. And yet, this government has not consulted with them up there. They are concerned about this because they're taking their people from the north into Winnipeg and even Montreal for addiction centers. There is no plan by this Liberal government to have addiction centers up north, and I'm wondering through, through you, I could ask our member to talk about the addiction centers that certainly will be needed when this bill comes law. The yeah, I member for Sarnia Lambton. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for an excellent question. Yes, this government has been woefully inadequate in putting in place treatment, not just in Nunavut, but across the country. We can see if we if we try to compare to other places that do this well, let's talk about public education and we can talk about treatment. Colorado spent $10 million on public education and they got 5 million people. Uh, Washington State spent $7 million and they've got 7 million people. Okay, and they spent that in the year ahead of the legalization. And uh, the 100,000 that we're talking about, we have 36 million people, is woefully inadequate. If you think about places like Portugal, the government is always co you know, comparing how well Portugal does things. Portugal has 170 treatment centers for 11 million people in a very small, drivable space. That is not the situation that we have in Canada, and we have to start putting emphasis on treatment for people, especially those who are predisposed. Nunavut has recognized the threat, and they have decided not to allow home growth along with Quebec and Manitoba, and treatment centers are needed there as well. Questions and comments? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary of the Government House Leader. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. If you, I, I've been following the Conservative de debate on this issue, and I, I find it amazing. If you think it through, what the Conservatives want to do and their position is to decriminalize uh, cannabis. So by decriminalizing uh, cannabis but not legalizing and putting in the regulations, I suspect that they will find great support from our gangs. That gangs would be the biggest benefactor of, and the criminal element, of the conservative policy on this issue. Because if you decriminalize it, that means the, the gangs can continue to get involved because, after all, it's, it's not legal, and now these individuals don't have to go to jail. Rather, they will get a fine. And uh, it just doesn't make any sense. Where we agree, I believe, is that over the last uh, decade, uh, we have seen our youth more engaged in cannabis uh, than any other Western uh, country uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the crisis that is currently there. This legislation will legalize, regulate, take uh, uh, and educate. Uh, there will be, I believe, uh, marginal uh, uh, criminal activities surrounding it. Uh, those uh, monies uh, will, in fact, be uh, generated for, uh, for government. Uh, I see it as a win-win-win, and the biggest winner here is our young people, because there will be more education, and it will, in fact, I believe, decrease the number of youth participating in cannabis. The Honourable Member for Sarnia Lambton. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank the uh, Parliamentary Secretary, the Government House Leader. Uh, but instead of talking about hy hypotheticals, let's talk about what organized crime is thinking about this government's legislation. They're jumping up and down. They're saying, hey, you know what? The going price for us is $7 a gram. This government's going to start at $10 a gram, and they're going to add another dollar. Not only that, they're going to do what Colorado did, allow home grow. See how profitable we've been there. Oh, by the way, this government also eliminated the visa requirements on people coming in from Mexico. So lots of experienced people can just move in and take over the whole thing. So I really think that when you think about organized crime and you think about the advantages they need and how the, the police have already said there's not enough for them to enforce all of the provisions for home grow in this legislation, organized crime is going to be happy, 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 because they're going to make a huge amount of money when people have to go through Kathleen Wynne's LCBO model between 9 and 6. Thanks. Resuming debate.